Chip Zdarsky writes a better Justice League book than Brian Michael Bendis. Justice League The Last Ride by Chip Zdarsky feels more like a proper Justice League book than the core title being written by Brian Michael Bendis, but it's not without its faults. One of the most important things about writing a team book is nailing the voices of the different characters. Bendis has a tendency to write characters that all feel very similar, losing much of what makes them unique. When Batman, Superman, and even the villain of the piece all use the same general terminology, sentence structures, and mannerisms, none of them feel like distinct personalities. This is part of the problem with Bendis' handling of the Justice League in the main Infinite Frontier title. In Chip Zdarsky's miniseries Justice League The Last Ride, the writer steps up and shows a strong understanding of the characters' voices. Which is good, because they talk a lot. As much as I prefer Zdarsky's take on the characters, this first issue of his run is far, far more tell than show. We are presented with a Justice League that has disbanded for an unspecified reason. There is a significant rift between Batman and Superman, and we are left wondering why. What could have brought the League so low? What could be so significant that they couldn't work through it, especially considering the League's history? This is the central mystery running through the issue, and it works fairly well. Something involving the Green Lanterns brings the League back together, or potentially so, as they convene to discuss how to handle the situation and if they are even going to reunite in the first place. Tensions are high. We are presented with a number of things that are different in this world, all of which seem to point back to the unknown event that ended the Justice League. But this is all done through dialogue with the characters talking about how things are different without any real significant display. If you removed the text from the book, you'd be hard-pressed to find anything different, save for Tal Jordan's outfit, which may or may not be entirely incidental. And honestly, I don't even know the answers to that after having read the issue. That being said, the issue isn't without its action. The sequences that Zdarsky chose to include may not contribute to the plot's progression, but it does highlight the concepts he is exploring and strengthens the character interaction. In particular, there is a scene centered around Batman and Superman that reinforces the rift between them, though it feels more like a relatively insignificant setting that serves the characters rather than the plot. As for the ideas that he's putting forth, even though they are spoken more than actually shown, there is enough here to really draw me in. For instance, Superman can't sleep because he keeps having nightmares. And this is nothing new. We've seen it plenty of times before. But it is an aspect of the character that I wish was highlighted more. The man with the world on his shoulders, who, despite all of his immense powers, can't help but feel inadequate. I'll talk about this more in a video I'm working on about Superman, but for now, I'll just say that its inclusion usually makes me feel like the writer has a decent grasp on what Superman is all about. It's a good sign. Or consider Lobo killing the new gods. Though this is only stated and not shown, my major problem with this issue, the notion that Lobo killed the new gods has so much potential if played right. We'll have to see where this goes in future issues, and hopefully we will get flashbacks to the event itself. Initially, I found the idea a little odd and wasn't too fond of it, but when I mulled it over a bit and I thought of it in the context of an alternate universe that is not immediately connected to the main continuity, I came to really like it. I want more crazy events like this, particularly in Elseworlds tales where they aren't afraid to play with insane ideas and tell some unconventional stories that wouldn't necessarily work the best as part of the primary continuity. And then there's Hal and the Green Lantern armor. It's a small thing, and may not mean much, but it could imply that he's becoming more militaristic, 
and I'm interested to see how that might play out. Perhaps a Hal Jordan who refocuses on combat, opting to become the primary muscle of the Green Lantern Corps, training in different ways to hunt down their foes in a very proactive manner. As with Lobo, I don't know that I would want to see this in the main continuity, but I would definitely enjoy it as an Elseworlds tale. And then there's the big kicker, the one that would really change the nature of the DC Universe. Hal wanting to make Earth's moon the new Oa. This plays into one of the ideas I have long wanted to play with if I were to ever write Green Lantern. The human Green Lantern Corps. Now I won't go too much into that idea, but moving the GLC base to the moon has all kinds of potential, both in refocusing galactic events onto Earth and in drawing in new threats to Earth that once remained far away. It would also give the Green Lanterns more direct interaction with Earth, which is something I often feel is lacking in their comics when things become grand scale. And again, I can go into my thoughts on that more another time. And of course, there's the rift between Batman and Superman. Again, we are only told the reasons, not shown anything directly relating to the events but we do get to see the emotional state of both of these heroes. Batman is distant, far more than normal, refusing to work with the other heroes entirely, concerned only with Gotham. Superman is racked with guilt, anger eating away at him, causing him to lash out in dangerous ways that are very uncharacteristic of him. These are both very believable and natural responses, fitting of the characters. I am eager to see this explored further, and though I have a notion of a ways that Darsky might bring resolution to the conflict, I'm hoping I am wrong. If he doesn't take the easy way out that I thought of, then Chip could explore some very complex emotions in these characters, and have the series say some powerful things about guilt, responsibility, anger, and a whole lot more. And all of this makes for a story that introduces big ideas, but does little with them, at least in the immediate sense. Hopefully this can be resolved as the series progresses, and I suspect it will, but it's a bit disappointing as an opening chapter. It can be difficult to write an establishing chapter and step outside of setup, so I can't entirely fault Zdarsky, but it does make for an issue that reads more like a synopsis than the story itself. If the series manages to step out of that shadow and quickly gets into storytelling more focused on the present and less the past, then the slight stumble of the opening issue will likely be quickly forgotten. Now, I do want to quickly mention a few small problems I noticed within the production of this issue itself. There's one error that I have seen pop up in various issues over the years, but is especially egregious here. In the production process of comics, the art is finalized before the speech bubbles are added. This is done with an additional layer that is separate and laid over the art. Sometimes the speech bubbles wind up misaligned, making them sit over part of the image when they aren't supposed to. But more significantly, the lines on the edge of the bubbles don't match up with the edge of the panel. Perhaps there is something more to the process that I am unaware of, but I don't really understand how this happens, or at least how it gets past editorial and goes to print with such a snafu. I have seen it elsewhere plenty in the past, so it's nothing new, but I thought it worth mentioning here because of how significant the gap is, meaning the speech bubble layer is significantly misaligned. And there was another error that I found really odd. Wally and Diana are in the watchtower waiting for Batman and Superman to show up. And Diana says, if people are in danger, they'll help. Then Superman shows up and says, though you're right, Flash. Yes, though you're right, Flash. If people are in danger, we'll be there. Now, I don't know if the layouts were different from the script, or if it was just a minor flub, or, or what. I can definitely understand how the mistake might happen, and it's not that big of a deal, but combined with the other mistakes, and I can't help but feel this issue wasn't given the attention it deserved, like it was rushed to print without proper editorial oversight. It's just 
sloppy. In the end, I am very interested in seeing where the story is going. I like the world that Zdarsky is building, and I feel he has a decent grasp on the varying voices present within the Justice League. Though I am coming away from the first issue with mixed feelings, I expect things to improve significantly from here on out. Hopefully, that faith in Zdarsky holds true. If the concepts presented here are anything to go by, the rest of this story should be a wild ride. It's just unfortunate that we had to have such an awkward first step in order to get there. Be sure to help me out by hitting like and subscribe, leave a comment to let me know your thoughts, and until next time, this is Uncle Joel saying, stay tangible.